So hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Salvador Munoz and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Outreach here at Poster House, which is of course the first and only museum in the United States dedicated to the art and history of the poster. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual program, Indigenous History is Poster History, with graphic designer and scholar Sadie Redwing. Describing the perspective of Indigenous ideology in visual communication is very challenging, especially to an audience who does not understand the harm of cultural appropriation. The role of an Indigenous, indigenous visual communicator requires the practice of visual sovereignty, or decolonizing the stereotypical representation into a traditional image for cultural education. Indigenous, indigenous visual communicators have the power to give Native Americans a respected face in the world by revealing tribal visual languages in visual communication. Sadie Redwing is a Lakota Dakota graphic designer and advocate from the Spirit Lake Nation. Redwing earned her BFA in New Media Arts and Interactive Design at the Institute of American Indian Arts. She received her Master's of Graphic Design from North Carolina State University. Her research on cultural revitalization through design tools and strategies created a new demand for tribal competence in graphic design research. Currently, Redwing serves as an assistant professor at OCAD University in Toronto, Ontario. Before we get started, I want to share a few notes on accessibility for this event. Automated closed captioning is available for anybody who needs or prefers it, and you can turn it on or off by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this program will be recorded and made available for all attendees after the event, so if you miss any portion, don't worry, you'll have the chance to catch up. Um, and if you have any questions during the program, you can drop them in the Q&A box or in the chat at any time, and we will go over them in the Q&A portion at the end of the program. And with that, I am going to go ahead and hand it over to Sadie. Awesome. Thank you, Sal. And man, I just appreciate everyone joining in. I know we're kind of uh, getting out of that virtual events and getting to more in person. So I'm just happy for those who are taking the time to come um, share this afternoon with me. I'm going to get my screen shared here. So give me a second and I'll go through introduction and kind of what to expect and then we'll get it moving here. So let me get set up. At any moment that either my mic goes out or if anything, I'll do my best to get back on the Zoom. But again, I uh, I do have a lot. It's a little bit loaded. If you've ever seen presentations from me, I do take up a lot of time. So again, I appreciate everyone joining uh, me here. So hamadakyapi tashina ziwi imachiapi na ampeta ata kiliwashtelo. So hello, everybody. My name is Sadie Redwing. My citizenship is from the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation. So I kind of got my little tribal flag in the corner. Um, I'm currently sitting in Toronto, Canada. So it's not Indigenous Peoples Month or Native American Heritage Month. So um, it's good. I'm kind of getting adjusted to uh, the November holidays here. Uh, but uh, coming into this presentation, a little bit of a context on what to expect. So I am a graphic designer and I'm also a design educator. I teach in two departments here, OCAD U in Toronto. One of the reasons why I'm in Toronto and not in the United States is the United States and even Mexico doesn't have, uh, how would you say, there isn't a large body of Indigenous professors at non-tribal art and design schools. OCAD U is one of the first to really bridge in those programs and have a full uh, solid Indigenous professors knowing at a non-tribal college. So coming in here, I'm bringing in two perspectives. One, think about graphic design. Two, working in the Indigenous visual culture program. And then within this presentation, I'm going to touch on a few things. Uh, one, how I got introduced to Poster House. Uh, introducing some of my work, and then knowing that at OCAD, we're really trying to build curriculum of Indigenous history in the graphic design history. So uh, talk a little bit about the graphic design canon, and then kind of go through of how you would bring some of that historical knowledge into, let's say, poster making, or just in the aspect of creating uh, graphic design. 
and then wrap up with just kind of some trends. So Brian Johnson did do a, uh, did do a wonderful presentation last year of a catalog. And uh, I want to kind of touch, ba touch base on that presentation and also to kind of talk about uh, just trends that you see in historical timeline, particularly United States, where you might see indigenous posters or just visual communication within posters, but then even kind of the preface or some of the challenges or just even in thinking about why possibly that body isn't strong or why might not we see a lot of graphic designers, you know, before the 2000s here, but I'm going to go ahead and get going here. So again, welcome Indigenous History is Poster History, uh, the main uh, the main or the first thing I want to uh, talk about is uh, how I got introduced to Poster House. So back in 2016, I just graduated from North Carolina State and right immediately after I got my, my diploma, I went to Standing Rock. So they had the fight against Dakota Access Pipeline. So 2016, everybody, well, not everybody, but uh, there was a call to action to get protesters and land protectors out to Standing Rock's nation uh, to stop the oil pipelines. And during that time, um, again, this is like 2016. This is even like be before the dropping of like racist mascots or just there was still a lot of conversations around stereotypes. Like we haven't even had a lot of dialogue on decolonization yet. So it's kind of crazy how much has changed since 2016. But starting at 2016, when huge movements like that were needing visual representation, some type of media to show what was going on uh, during that time, there was a lot of stereotypes. So in thinking about how to build more visual communication that is kind of uh, speaking to a movement, particularly as Lakota and Dakota going against the Dakota Access Pipeline, I created this image. And what was so beautiful about this image is this was this is what really brought me into the graphic design profession and brought me into a lot of designer spaces. And one of the reasons why this uh, got so, I guess, uh, got shared at, uh, mass across the United States is a gentleman named Cy Wagner. He comes from the Bay Area and he had the Indigenous People's Power Project. And he said, hey, Sadie, he's like, can we have this image also with the Amplifier Foundation as well? So people were looking for non-stereotypical posters to protest against the pipelines and showing a poster or I guess the image with a little bit more visual or visual elements that speak to, let's say, a Lakota and Dakota audience, uh, this poster got picked up in a sense. Because before you're just seeing like Chief Sitting Bull's face or just some like those corny uh, stereotypical icons that are decorative on posters, but not actually showing the visual language of that demographic. So I'm so blessed and so happy that uh, the Indigenous People's Power Project, the Amplifier Project, uh, shared this file free for free and then again like just across the nation schools uh youth groups those who are workshopping they use that image and even the uh the poster house folks shared my image as well so that was kind of my first introduction and understanding the importance of visually communicating but then also communicating with an intention of a target audience or visually communicating uh from uh, the indigenous perspective without the reliance on stereotypes and, and stuff like that. But I want to come back to, I'll come back to that uh, poster or that graphic in a second, but kind of diving in and thinking about just that making. So uh, like I said, I, it, at OCAD, you were really pushing on getting more graphic design history courses and lessons that really talk about graphic design in the United States or in the continent of North America. Because usually if you're a graphic designer, you take a, a graphic design course and the history of graphic design is always across these, particularly from Europe. But in thinking about how we can kind of get a uh, terminology of how indigenous design uh, is categorized. So right now it's kind of still in that craft, like, uh, if you're looking for indigenous graphic design, it still might be labeled as craft or art or just in type of some type of painting, but not really actually explaining the semiotics of this. So one of the things I do at OCAD, particularly in a graphic design program, is really trying to bring semiotic research terminology to critique or analyze indigenous design. So kind of bringing it out of primitive art, bringing it out of ancient are but really talking about the terminology of graphic design and what we use in graphic design and how we can look at that 
through the lens when we're kind of looking at indigenous visual languages. But in think about semiotics. So if you are a graphic design student or a alum or a professor, that concept of semiotics, or you talk about the basics of signing, so using signs, uh, differentiating the difference between symbols and icons or even indexes. But the main thing around semiotics in analyzing indigenous design, in, and I'm going to start saying invention. So in, in thinking about inventions, but just ways of how we communicated, recorded, and documented before the 1400s is part of our graphic design history. It's just not in the history books <laughs> yet, but just in kind of just building that, that terminology or just building that understanding of what actually graphic design is and how we can analyze that with um, indigenous inventions, indigenous design. So as a student, I uh, this was the main textbook that I uh, used, or I guess was given to me in a sense of taking a graphic design history course. And anytime you're like graphic design <laughs> communities or practices, you always hear about the canon. And usually the canon always starts out with the printing press, uh, which I'll get to in a second. But in thinking about, there's a little bit of highlights, maybe not full chapters on how maybe other uh, other uh, demographics across the globe uh, documented before uh, the 1400s, but essentially it's common in graphic design history. You know a little bit about little, know a little bit about uh, semiotics or just how the use of let's say hieroglyphs are used to document. Uh, maybe a little bit you might know about like the Mayan calendar or just maybe some of our relatives in Mexico how they documented within the stone or carvings or any type of picto or visuals. Uh, of course, we get to know about like more Latin languages in the sense of how the those creation, particularly in the tools or maybe chiseling or just how the, the creation of how um, uh, signs like this are now how we use to write. We'll come back to that in a second too. But in a sense of in a in graphic design history book like this, I really don't see a lot of documentation, particularly to uh, indigenous peoples within the continent of North America, or I wanna say a little bit more focus of the US. Uh, here for this. So in thinking about US, so not necessarily focusing on Canada right now, Mexico, man, it's Indigenous Peoples Day and even thinking, or not day, month, but in thinking about like how far Mexico still has to go in federally recognizing their Indigenous nations. So again, in thinking about there's still a lot of progression we got to do, but for this particular section or just even where I'm coming in, I'm focusing on the United States. So in thinking about bringing in some of that history, so canon, usually in, in kind of starting out the, the, I guess, where or the time where graphic design was being brought over to the U.S. or getting introduced to something like Johann Gutenberg's printing press. So I want to know that I'm not like shitting on in the uh, Johann's printing press if anything, in, in means of an invention or tool, it's a pretty good invention and tool in a sense of how well it was invented and intended to use. If you want to talk about the, the tools component of colonization and how much it's really spread mass media, particularly in thinking about print mass printing Bibles, uh, but in a sense of really comparing why maybe the printing press isn't indigenous to the United States, Bible is that it brought over. Been thinking about if we didn't have the printing press in the United States, how are we mass producing? How are we cataloging? How are we documenting? You know, sharing histories in the sense of of uh, you know, kind of retaining traditions that are devices to help us pass oral traditions. But and think about the makeup of the printing press. So the printing press. So I'm thinking about Johann Gutenberg, like he's uh, got a staff over there. They're cutting down trees for wood. He got the metals. He got to make the uh, the letters. In a sense of a lot of the materials needed weren't, weren't necessarily the main tools or materials being used in the United States. But just in thinking about paper, so paper, uh, a little bit maybe of exploitation of trees, if there's no implementation plan to regrow trees after cutting down trees for paper, a lot of metals, mind you, we didn't have metals, metals are brought over uh, to the United States through colonization, and then even the inks, these concept of inks, so uh, knowing that these resources are not super eco-friendly, <laughs> they're not, they're I'm assuming at this time, the implementation plan to uh, keep these resources growing, the longevity, so they don't run out, they don't exploit, 
Uh, I don't think the plans were there just yet. Uh, but in thinking about that concept of, of uh, having a tool like the printing press uh, to, I guess, pump out uh, mass mass quality or mass quantities of a particular type of design or graphic design uh, products. But in thinking of a tool like that may not work in an indigenous society if you're thinking of depending on place. So for example, uh, as Lakota, Dakota, I come from the Great Plains. Within the Great Plains, it's a system, it's a system that we run through nomadic. So if you think about nomadic, uh, a history or a tradition or an identity or demographic that is nomadic, we're constantly on the go, meaning that we're following migration patterns of the buffalo within the seasons. Uh, if you, uh, I'll show a little bit of our, about our teepees and stuff like that, but in thinking about a lifestyle that is nomadic, you're camping one place, you're picking up, you're going, you're not in one spot. So in thinking about if we had the printing press, <laughs> Uh, before the 1400s, and I'm in a nomadic society, man, I would not want to be the one who has to haul the printing press, meaning that it's heavy. Um, I got my horse, like, man, my poor horse, if I got to load up all the inks, the letters, because mind you, if you have the little metals of the little tiny letters, uh, and then the numbers, and you have different sizes, fonts, like, that's a lot of metal. <laughs> like, that is a lot of uh, I guess clunky stuff to uh, to carry around as we're following the buffalo. So in a sense of, it's a uh, yeah, my horse will be super exhausted carrying that around. But then even the concept of exploiting trees. So again, in the Great Plains, we didn't have a lot of trees. It's a little bit more in the woodlands area. But in the needs of paper, we still have a lot of reliance on paper. Uh, and thinking about that constant manifest destiny, where there's a lot of addiction that comes from that those uh, colonizers that exploit. We see it with our relatives in the Amazon. But get just in thinking about if Johann Gutenberg had an implementation plan to grow more trees after every like 50 Bibles that he printed out, I feel like we'd have a greater models of reciprocity to keep uh a trees in fruition if we are going to have super dependency on paper, which times are changing. We're getting into a little bit more technical time. But the main thing that I'm trying to say is one of the reasons why Lakotas or Dakotas are Great Plains, we didn't have the printing press because it's heavy. We're constantly on the move. But just even thinking about that concept of space. So again, in thinking with the printing press, now we have opportunities to print more letters. Uh, sentences are getting longer, more sentences equal to more pages, more pages, more pages, more pages, more illustrations, more books, more books to flood the bookshelf. So if you can kind of get where I'm getting at in a sense of if sentences are getting longer, books are getting longer, books are, are now getting into bookshelves, it's continuing to grow and to grow and to grow. And again, if I'm nomadic, like I don't want to be carrying all this stuff <laughs> with me. And if you can kind of see where I'm going is the more books, get more into libraries. Then we got libraries that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, where now there's an impermanent place. So again, if you're nomadic, um, this isn't necessarily the lifestyle that, that uh, works for us. But just knowing that concept of just that mass production, that mass archiving is taking up a lot of space. Libraries are getting bigger in a sense of of that, that feeling of colonization. So it's really interesting if you're somebody that's kind of really interested in um, maybe looking at more eco-friendly ways of documentation outside of more tech or internet spaces or cloud spaces. If you're somebody who's kind of looking at more, more eco-friendly tactics of working or of, of producing graphic design materials, uh, this is an opportunity to kind of really bridge indigenous design inventions and how we were able to be super efficient <laughs> and super uh, mindful of just the resources that we are trying not to exploit. But then also the, the longevity, how even to this day, we still utilize some of these recording methods. So enough with Johan, getting into these actual concepts of graphic design, but in order for me to walk through or kind of give an understanding of the semiotics or how we might create and invent recording devices, I want to walk through, through these few examples and then go in specifically to uh, how I design, particularly maybe within posters with the Lakota and Dakota perspective. But the concept of memory, so again, like when I'm in class with my students, I have to paint the picture of what 
the continent of North America looked like before colonization. That's challenging. Like that's one of the hardest parts about being an indigenous professional is that folks cannot visually imagine what the continent was like, just as simple as like 400 years ago. Like that's a small amount of time, but yet we have zero clue on how the continent has functioned predominantly indigenous. But in thinking about, okay, if we didn't have books, we didn't have the printing press, we didn't have markers, Sharpies, like inks didn't come over, those Bibles, the paper didn't come over just yet. We had to figure out a way to remember something. And again, that concept of having a memory device. If you come from a nation that has the inventions of the dream catcher, the importance of a bead. When you look at that bead, maybe it's a particular color, maybe where it's it, where it's uh placed in the dream catcher that bead will remind you of that dream that you don't want to forget so uh you see a lot of that same invention that same technology through knots maybe a particular type of knot or style of a knot uh is able to help you remember something so trying to think of ways of how we use visual cues to really document and record. Um, this is more of a contemporary piece, but I like that aspect of bringing something a little bit more contemporary. So let's say when the railroads are coming through the Southwest, but just knowing that this isn't a newspaper, this isn't a book, this is actual visuals of pictos or uh, some type of forms of uh, signage on a device or an invention like a pottery piece as helping us record or remember particular events in history. Um, we see that on, on all types of inventions and thinking about the wampum, how there's so much significance and so much history uh, documented in these wampum belts or just even in a sense of beadwork or a sense of how something might be archived on some type of grid. So I think about rug weaving, uh, basketry, quill work, but just in thinking about that concept of recording this symbol or this image or this icon is supposed to be a memory uh, recording device only because we just said we didn't have books. Uh, in, in thinking about these concepts of just documentation or the importance, and again, that frustration when someone sees some of this documentation or visuals or not really understanding the importance of what it could mean or what it might be, be signing. Um, but again, in thinking about if we're gonna bring those tactics of creating memory devices or just that concept of semiotics or through signage, if you want to learn or want to have a greater understanding of where this might be in a historical sense or how we might use it in, in visuals to this day, the one of the main areas of research that I give my students is uh, this concept of traditional, traditional, traditional ecological knowledge. Now, traditional ecological knowledge as actually introduced to this term in a foods class, but in a sense of, and I kind of tell my students too, if you think about it, if you have a history documented before the invention of a textbook, uh, TEK might be a, a solid uh, research framework, just in a sense of our knowledge of everything that we learned, if you want to label it around rhetor uh, rhetorical criticism, or just that concept of learning through experience. But there's so much knowledge and science that we know within the land that we didn't read from a textbook, <laughs> that we didn't, you know, we didn't get a lecture on it. Like we already, we already knew it based on our experience before colonization. So again, we I do have students, I know there's students out there that are really trying to bring in pre-printing press uh, uh, documentation devices as a uh, how would you say as like citations or something, but just in thinking about there's still a challenge and I've, and I, it's getting a little bit better, but in a sense of, again, really trying to understand the difference between TEK, someone's land knowledge from a particular type of place, uh, how uh, we still have evidence and, and uh, records pre 1400s and then not confusing it or doing better on communicating. So we're not talking about necessarily our religion or our beliefs, but our actual knowledge and, and all those aspects are really helpful, particularly now in working with climate or land or regeneration, climate change is coming up, but now in these concepts of sustainability and reciprocity, perfect time to bring an in indigenous perspective into these spaces. So what you're seeing is, so this is 
uh, I guess a glimpse of South Dakota. So coming in from South Dakota, again, like I never know. Anytime I come into a space or do a, re a, a workshop or presentation, I never know if someone's ever been to South Dakota or know what North, North Dakota or South Dakota looks like. But in the focus of my TEK, so my TEK is coming in through the Great Plains. And again, if you, and this is probably what it looks like right now in a sense of the grass is not green anymore. It's probably snow. Uh, buffalo is the main thing. Again, I never know if someone's ever seen a buffalo before, but in thinking about how the buffalo is a perfect resource in the in the means of my own inventions, my own re uh, recording devices, and then the visual languages or the visual language that I might share to a particular type of audience that I might use in a poster or that I might use um, in some type of decorative form that I might be communicating at. But again, in order to understand some of those buffalo tropes in a lot of my uh, graphic design work, the uh, the concept of TEK is coming it would be the importance. So um, I don't have enough time to kind of go through a whole lecture or kind of go to about like what the reci reciprocal model of the buffalo is. But for this next slide, to have an understanding that if you want to keep the prairie alive, you're gonna need a uh, healthy soil. In order to have healthy soil, you can't over till the soil, which right now, you know, a lot of machinery, a lot of cattle farms, a lot of corn crops, a lot of pesticides, it's a lot devastated, all that colonization has been de devastated into the prairie. But just in thinking about how much tall grass is an aid in cleaning air, like I feel, I feel like people don't know that. <laughs> like, I feel like people don't know how much tall grass cleans air. Hence of one of the reasons why we followed the buffalo around so much is that they were the key component in keeping the prairie alive. And then also like within our livelihood, like we ate it, uh, buffalo, uh, we closed ourselves, we had shelter. But if I was going to create a poster, an infograph, or some type of educational device with the use of our visual language that I am signing the importance of the reciprocal model of buffalo, this is what it would look like. So this is a little bit of more contemporary mix of traditional. So hence, there's a little bit more florals to kind of give an idea of like, okay, uh, where that might be placed as a symbol. But in thinking about our symbol, and I'll explain a little bit within the symbols in a second. But again, just kind of giving an understanding of I could use a poster like this to explain the importance of buffalo and the, uh, the, the reciprocal model of why we need the buffalo to keep tall grass alive. So um, again, it's a, that's a little bit more on the science side, but just in the sense of something like this, when someone sees a poster like this, they immediately think a little bit more decorative, but maybe not understanding the science of what it's saying, just because the visual competency isn't there, but just kind of giving an understanding of I might be using particular particular TEK uh, practices or methods when I'm creating graphic design. Some people think it looks pretty, but just in a sense of uh, and using it in a sense of just keeping that form of documentation alive. We see it a lot in our winter counts. So again, being mindful on where we're at in the nation. If we are in the central of North America, we don't have a lot of trees. We have to rely on snow. So when think about we didn't have calendars back then, how we would record or document. But if the main thing, if you can get from this slide, is that these, uh, if you want to call them icons, I would say they're a little bit more indexed than, than maybe symbols. But just knowing that one of these the icon index or symbols records a whole year. So if you count these, it's probably about 60 years. But in a sense, again, like, it's easier for me to roll up this buffalo hide, throw it in my backpack or my back, instead of carrying 100 books that document 60 years of history. So the importance of needing a recording device, needing some type of signage to remember uh, an oral history or something that might have happened. Um, and then again, and think about the utilization of buffalo, one of the most eco-friendly resource. The main thing is just keeping them alive, <laughs> keeping them mating. But we can, we can have all these materials and access without machines, without the uses of metal, without exploiting trees, just those same concepts. It's just the, the opposite of why we uh, might not, uh, or how would you say in a sense of if we're so focused on phones right now to remember stuff for us, we're kind of losing those concepts of just the importance of oral history. But again, and thinking about how would we communicate at mass, 
Uh, so for example, if we had a, a, a tribal council meeting, we got a uh, hundred folks, you know, coming around, you know, having a conversation there, how, you know, some type of visuals or forms that they can see. So if you can imagine how big a buffalo is, a big a buffalo hide, we have these winter counts and noticing it's a spiral. So in thinking about this concept of a spiral, how that might have been in the place of being used to just, uh, uh, how would you say, keep uh, a lot of, or utilizing all the space, meaning that instead of having symbols go from left to right in like a grid format, maybe it's easier to get more symbols onto a buffalo hide in a circular pattern. But then also there's a lot of uh, connections amongst like circle, hoop, relations, some astrology and those aspects. But the main thing for this presentation is just to understand when you see something like this, if you want to call it a poster from back in the day, that's okay. But in a sense of how we signed without the uses of books. Um, now, like this, this is old. I don't even know if uh, if museums are really still doing this anymore, but trying to decipher or decode some of those winter counts. Um, I would, uh, uh, because how we formed is not necessarily the same of like writing or understanding the English language, but again, that uses of symbols, the uses of icons, indexes within the semiotics. And then I have these just example, just again, just to have those visuals of what our visual languages look like. Again, if we didn't have markers or sharp, Sharpies to write our name on stuff, if we're traveling from uh, Alaska all the way down to Argentina, we spoke different languages, like there has to be a, some sense of form of visual sovereignty to knowing that where we come from. Or if you think about like, if you're on a horseback and you lose something, like I use this piece of luggage here, how would they know where that luggage came from? So again, if we didn't have like name tags, <laughs> or like if we didn't, not everybody was universal and English, like you have to be more creative and have some type of visual sovereignty to differentiate where you're coming from or in a sense of, of how you might identify in a space and working within those tribal systems. So all that form of visual language, all that form of visual sovereignty, I bring it into my graphic design work. And a lot of my graphic design work is really targeted at, well, uh, target at either what's going on Nowadays, it's a little bit more on Instagram in a sense of maybe not necessarily physical posters, but again, as I kind of transition out of the TEK and kind of going into the visual language of some of the stuff that I might build within the poster forms, there's a lot of material on here from Indigenous Peoples Day which was last month, but like the Buffalo, I'm showing this example too, because I have to have a little bit of an understanding of maybe some of that symbolism. But again, coming from the Dakotas, this is probably the perfect time to come when it's like green uh, in July, the prairie is beautiful. But again, if you can't necessarily, it's not much trees, it's more grassland based, but we do have a species of porcupine that's indigenous to the prairie. And if you can kind of just grasp the, the concept of a grid, so like other indigenous nations across the, the nation, that concept of weaving or overlapping fibers on a grid is an oper opportunity or allowance of how maybe uh, something, that, that me, something that you're trying to sign might look a little bit more like 8-bit, if that kind of makes sense. So for example, when you weave porcupine quills and you're working on this grid, you're not going to have images that look like a painted picture. You're going to have images that kind of look like 8-bit Nintendo or kind of like pixel or just even thinking about you can only probably do more right angles or uh, squares or line work when you're working on a grid. Uh, so in kind of bringing in some of that grid or kind of working with particular type of fibers, like if we deciphered this out, I would say this is a little bit more symbol based. If you can kind of see within the corners here, uh, there's a there's like a little flower budding. And if you kind of start to kind of build your competency and how you might read an image like this, this flower budding and within the zigzag pattern that's supposed to represent the bending of a porcupine, it's just a root. So I've been thinking about the concept of visually showing land resources, again, TEK, land resources, bringing in those concepts, but understanding something might look a little bit more symbolic pattern, so like symmetry, what people really like about that concept of balance, but a lot of that comes from the grid. So we kind of see it in more or in uh, traditional beadwork, contemporary beadwork is a little bit more uh, free motion, but and then and think about porcupine quills. If you're trying to quill something, um, it's going to be a little bit more, uh, not like 
um, not super iconic like it's going to be more symbolic just because what you're trying to make on a grid may not make a very perfect representation of what you might be signing. Um, I have this in here again if anybody is really interested or just wants an introduction. I do like Carrie Lifford's uh, quill and beadwork of the Western Sioux. One of the reasons why I like it is she's honest in the sense of getting information from the 1400s, not the 1400s, from the 1940s. There was limitations, but then also there wasn't as much uh, archival history in that uh, sense of understanding the visuals of, let's say, uh, the visual language of indigenous nations. But again, if you can kind of grasp the symbolic so again not iconic these don't necessarily look exactly like a feather it doesn't look exactly like a dragonfly it's a symbol a symbol that was formed out of that grid aspect but we see some of those elements in uh, a lot of the posters that are targeted to indigenous uh, demographics or created by indigenous demographics so this was and again just to kind of see contemporary example the more the symbolism in here, this doesn't look exactly like two butterflies. This doesn't look like a, a exactly like an eagle wingspan. Uh, this doesn't look like a blue star in the middle. It's a symbol. It's not iconic. It's a symbol. And think about how we bring some of that symbolism and decorate decorating uh, some type of poster. So in thinking about winter counts, symbols, signage, invention, tools, all of that, all of that within indigenous TEK, we can start to now decipher and analyze posters or how we might design a little bit better. And again, I'm speaking a little bit more to indigenous audience, uh, but if you are non-indigenous, it's kind of your first time seeing some of this stuff, it's just an opportunity to really build your competency or your visual language of what you might see. And I wanna make a point in here is the trends in history in a sense of, of uh, how, uh, how would you say, trends of how uh, maybe at a, at a particular tech, at a particular decade, you might see more indigenous representation comparison to another decade. So for example, in the 60s, so when Brian Johnson gave his, his uh, lecture last year, he had a beautiful archive of historical posters created by indigenous people or for indigenous people. And if you have a chance to view that, that presentation, uh, there's a trend based on how much representation of indigenous culture you see. And usually you see that trend as that roller coaster, depending on what our relationship is with the government at the time. <laughs> so in a sense of, uh, uh, I'll show some examples here, but in a sense of if universities were starting to build more student programs, if we're getting more tribal colleges, if uh, in thinking about when the AIM movement was coming out of the 70s before the six, the 60s with the Relocation Act in the sense of getting more indigenous people in urban places, 70s we got the AIM movement and then again the advancement within uh, pr production of posters or any type of graphic, graphic design media and in thinking about uh, promotional material for powwows, here we got an example of the Sundance uh, poster or just even flyers. And again, our relationship in the 70s was a lot different because then we got, uh, we're in the news media at the time, we got festivals like uh, for those uh, who were trying to bring in like unity amongst everybody in the nation amongst you know following the Vietnam War. Um, but in thinking about this, like, these examples that you see here, there are gaps in history due to assimilation and genocide, but just having an understanding that you can probably decipher or see some type of conventions from that TEK and thinking about this concept of working in a circle, we're seeing buffalo tropes, more land tropes, um, and, and thinking about those are the particular type of icons or symbols that might read for that intended audience, so that Lakota Dakota audience. And thinking about, we always see a lot of like zigzag or right angle or just in the conventions that come, come a little bit more symbolic um, that we can kind of see a little bit more decorative format in a sense. But the main thing that I kind of want to share in these next few examples is uh, some of the stuff, some of the posters, I should say, within uh, some of the visuals that you're they're seeing that might target 
a indigenous audience, sometimes it may not make sense <laughs> in a way, because again, we're still at the point where we're still trying to like build an archive and really understand and build our competencies of these visuals. So some of the stuff can be a little bit corny, but then also again, in thinking about if you come from uh, or if you are a demographic that is a surviving genocide and assimilation, just even getting indigenous visuals onto a poster are big moves. Now, right now, as our educators, we have the opportunity to kind of decipher and, and really explain more the, uh, uh, how would you say, not necessarily the mistakes. So for example, on this, uh, this Niagara Falls, uh, October 1st, we have some of this at ledger art that you might see a little bit more within the plains, particularly uh, a lot of historical documentation around the battles of Little Bighorn. But knowing that some of the imagery here isn't necessarily indigenous to Niagara Falls, <laughs> or just even knowing that, again, and thinking about if, if you're somebody that has low competency and you're looking at images based on place, in the imagery of indigenous peoples within the, uh, the new northern east northeastern area, uh, there's a little bit of a disconnect in there. So, in thinking about when we kind of look back and see all these tropes of indigenous culture, I'm gonna say from the 40s to the 90s, um, there's been waves where uh, you might see some of that traditional culture on communicating a very important message. But again, in thinking about, uh, it's kind of, it's a little bit confusing, or again, there's a little bit of a stress on the actual traditional culture and that visual communication, because at that time, it wasn't necessarily there. So again, I always, it's always interesting to kind of see that, uh, again, whatever our relationship was with the government at the time, getting out of the, going from the 70s to the 80s, where now we're getting a little bit more IHSs or Indian Health Services created, where now a lot of the posters are kind of like negative connotations in the sense of you're seeing more indigenous posters around AIDS or domestic violence or alcoholism or drug use or suicides. So just in thinking about the message, you might be negative, but yet you're showing like indigenous culture is kind of like a little of a disconnect there, or it kind of made you think like, hmm, like I wish we could have had this educational graphic design back then. So we wouldn't have to be using cultural or just even sensitive or just even thinking about our visual languages are a little bit more sacred and in, 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 in finding better ways to visually communicate uh, some of these messages are a little bit more targeted, but again, and think about that when Brian gave his presentation last year, really the historical uh, trends that you might see. So going in from like 80s into 90s where reservations were hit really hard, 90s, I was thinking like that, pover or that poverty porn <laughs> in a sense of everything was getting, everything negative about the reservation time was so negative. We saw it in, in the 90s and then and think about, we started to kind of flow, um, uh, how would you say, kind of like grow, gross more. So if that if that trend is kind of um, moving up to, again, trying to fight for land rights or just even voting rights or any type of people's civil rights or people's rights, you see a lot of more of that visual culture in those areas. These examples I'm showing here and still evident to this day, particularly if you follow the land back movements, uh, one of my favorite archives of posters is really, and, and it's something that I like to place myself into, is really looking at the political side or just even how uh, we are building posters or visual commission media that allows us to really sh uh, highlight what we represent. But again, and back and kind of looking at some of these older uh, posters, we always see like Chief Sitting Bull or um, something of maybe more in relation to a, a figure of a person. So what I like to, or in, in looking at this and kind of understanding of some of these, uh, I guess, tropes or visual messaging in, uh, in trying to not, not, it's not replicating it, but in thinking about these movement to this day, we now have the knowledge and technology to not utilize, let's say a cheap space all the time. Like we have the knowledge and technology and education where we can actually target particular type of nations instead of maybe a more pan Indian nation. So again, that's so beautiful how these, uh, these shifts are moving. But one of the reasons why it's so challenging 
is depending on the relationship with the government, our access to resources and materials. And then again, a lot of that visual communication is messaging, uh, I guess maybe more negative stuff, but then they're using a lot of positive imagery on it. So again, the importance of needing some of this pr perspective and design curriculum, um, but going back to this piece again, I'm gonna wrap up on my actual, I guess, posters that I make, but in a sense of without reliance of like Chief Sitting Bull's head, kind of bringing in some of that symbolic visual language that you've seen within the porcupine quills, or just even understanding those tropes where when you start to decipher the composition of graphic design materials like this, there's a lot of land tropes. So if you can think about like a sun coming up uh, uh, from behind a river, or maybe kind of like in the hills or the mountain ways, so many Wichoni, water is life. Uh, another series of mini we chose on. So again, 2016, our relationship with the, with the government at the time wasn't so well. So and to see the trends of what is coming out in that poster production, a lot of it was for water rights, clean water, or just even sovereign rights. How, uh, in, uh, let's say the United States might come into sovereign lands and are not supposed to. So and thinking about, again, that trends of seeing the messaging of what is going on. Um, another poster of mine, and think about, again, more kind of visual communication within the defunding of oil pipelines. Again, the um, I'm, I'm curious to kind of see what the trends are going to be in the next 30 years. But in knowing uh, as a graphic designer in this decade, a lot of my posters and materials that um, that I've created in a sense of messaging, particularly around um the land protection, and then utilizing indigenous visual language of tropes with TEK of my own indigenous nation, so Great Plains. So again, the florals, uh, the the uh, the icons of maybe the shelter, uh, the shelter or, or homes. In a sense, uh, I did this for the the vote campaign with um, Illuminative. In the sense of just trying to build. Uh, more and I think I think in the United States people are like voting now or I see it like on the on the on the news but again in bringing in if I'm targeting a Great Plains demographic I'm going to utilize some of that TEK that traditional ecological knowledge that they recognize and then that they use try to get away from just putting sunglasses on a chief's face but just kind of bringing in our own uh, symbolism maybe our own color schemes our own animal tropes and knowing that this is targeted to a particular demographic, we're kind of getting out of that pan-Indianism now in a sense of more indigenous people are having more, are ex expressing sovereignty a lot more. But again, I'm happy that you know my work is being archived in this area and to know that um, a lot of my re research education are just even in a place like OCAD where we can build curriculum to get better at teaching up and coming graphic designers to design posters like this in a sense of our relationship with the governments are probably gonna be a roller coaster for another hundred years, but just in a sense of those who are visually communicating um, that they have the tools research and just better terminology <laughs> coming out of that primitive and ancient art. So that's it for me. I appreciate everyone com coming and listening in. I'm gonna um, stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna grab a, a drink of my coffee and then um, come back into the Zoom session. So again, thank you everybody for uh, uh, having this time for me to share my work with you. Sadie, thank you so much. This was such a fantastic presentation. Um, I know that I personally learned a lot. I'm sure that all of our attendees learned a lot. We do have a lot of questions that are coming through from the Q&A portion as well as in the chat. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start uh, vocalizing them. Also, there's a lot of compliments in there. I'll be sure to send you the chat transcript because this, this was an excellent presentation and I'm just like so blown away. Um, the first question that we have comes from a fellow Native artist, and they want to know how you respectfully approach elders and other artists to ask them or share their our oral histories and visual traditions. They sometimes worry that uh, asking about these things comes off as greedy or disrespectful, and we're wondering if you had any advice to share. Yeah, so I feel like Again, in thinking about that generation aspect, a lot of historical trauma, depending on that, maybe the household who has experienced forced government traumas like boarding schools, or just even being mindful that maybe older generations didn't have access to a lot of 
uh, stuff that we're able to see on social media or just even being in a safe classroom space or just even in thinking about if you come from a, a let's say a reservation or a nation that's more rural uh, kind of like in the kind of like in the middle of nowhere where you aren't don't have access to a lot of what's going on I know for myself my grandmother I uh, again in thinking about having to really be patient and then just be mindful in a sense of not, uh, how would you say? If she has had a rough experience as an indigenous person in the United States, trying to at least have a calming sense. So for example, uh, like I don't necessarily come out right, ask my grandma something, like we have a little bit of a dialogue, but trying to be in a place of, of, um, of comfort. So that might just be uh, having a cup of coffee at the table, you know, just kind of really uh, just being mindful of, of their mental health at the time. Um, what is challenging too is like the levels of competency of where you come from. So if you come from the East Coast, uh, there's a, there's many generations that haven't had access to any culture whatsoever. And thinking about uh, the, the Southwest or maybe within the Midwest, where the levels of access is a little bit different. Uh, but in thinking about asking for information, the main thing is developing that trust and that you stick to your word. So, for example, I do come from a community that's exploited a lot. So meaning that people will want to come to our communities, they want to learn our indigenous languages, they want to know our practices, and then uh, then they exploit them. So in that concept of exploitation, I think what is uh, really respectful is that you have an intention, you have a game plan of what you intend to do with that knowledge so they're not profiting off of it. And I don't mean profiting by like, by like money, but just in a sense of if there's any concept of giving back, so I feel like we're getting better at building trust, but just to be mindful at the older generations, they experience something a little bit different. Their triggers are a little bit different where the, how they might mentally uh, concept. I know my grandmother apologizes a lot, meaning that she doesn't, you know, she lost a lot in boarding school. So uh, I got to be mindful on, I don't want to say anything that's going to, you know, develop and uh, bring up an old memory that might, uh, uh, change the subject or we may not get to I may not get the same information that I intend to get to but if there is an opportunity to build trust explain why you're needing this language what or what information how you're going to use it and how you intend to utilize it for that particular community tribe family or whatever um, that would be, be my best uh, go-tos but yeah sometimes it's kind of challenging when we have to put ourselves in the shoes of our elders because they experience so much. And then, then again, like technology, man, like technology has just created a huge gap in um in how how we learn in in many senses. So uh, that's that's the best like advice I can give right now. Thank you, thank you. And uh, sort of touching on um, uh, what you uh, sort of ended on around like exploitation and like profiting, um, how can we as designers prevent the cultural appropriation of indigenous designs? Yeah, so we just had an appropriation lecture in my class, but the main things I had wanted my students to know is the definition between adapting something versus appropriating something, versus blending or fusing something. Uh, when I, so let's say that it's Indigenous Peoples, or it's Native American Heritage Month in the States right now. And during this time, I get a lot of emails, particularly around like branding for the month. I get it from like PBS. And if you're working, let's say if you're non-Indigenous and you are assigned a job where you have to work in the visual language or you got to promote a holiday or a whole, uh, I guess, the, the cultural month, instead of just going on Google, finding a pattern to replicate, I know us, I know there's many Indigenous artists and designers that are guilty of going to Google, pulling something that may not be uh, directly from their family or from their community, but the safe aspects of avoiding appropriation is to visually communicate what indigenous people can read. And the advantage of being indigenous in the United States is that we can always read land, like land tropes. 
So meaning that if you're from the Southwest, you recognize the peaks and the mountains. If you're from the coast, like you represent the tropes within, or the, sorry, the, the Pacific coast, North Pacific coast, you recognize the tropes within maybe more uh, woodlands, uh, cedar dense area. If you're from the plains, man, show us our prairie flowers, like show us our beautiful grasses. And it, but it's to the point where some people don't even know like what flowers are indigenous to uh, particular type of regions. Uh, but I always say, instead of just using patterns or getting away from the patterns, like we know patterns are beautiful, like humans like balance, patterns show balance, but in means of going with our land back initiatives, show us our land tropes. Like I want to see uh, my prairie, the, all my tropes from the prairie, animals from the prairie, flowers from the prairie. Uh, I want to, uh, you know, if I come from the Atlantic coast, like I want to see uh, stuff that you can only get in the Atlantic ocean, not the Pacific ocean. So I always say if, to avoid appropriation, know our natural resources indigenous to the area, go uh, go uh, reach out to the environmental studies or the botany or ethnobotany or whatever opportunity to collab. But we don't always need a pattern sometimes. Like we just want to see our land resources. And as a graphic designer, um, that could be like the, the like just step one, getting a list of flowers indigenous to the prairie, indigenous to the desert, indigenous to the jungle, indigenous to the Arctic. And um, there might not be a lot of plants up there, but <laughs> but just just think thinking about just natural resources, we can read those. We've been in those ecosystems for thousands of years. I want to see that. I'm the target audience of that. <laughs> Wonderful answer. And um, sort of again, a beautiful segment into the next question because we have a few people who are asking for resources. Um, is there any indigenous design book or something else that's available that might highlight um, indigenous design history? Man, we we were building them, <laughs> but it's not a large bank um, like uh, maybe like other demographics have. But I'm going to drop this link because uh, one of the first uh one of the first websites I ever came across was Neben South Hall. Man, Neben, uh, along with other indigenous designers out there like Leo Vicente and Brian, and uh, there's a large, large group of us are really trying to build those resources. In the chat, I dropped a link um, to, or um, I might need you to <laughs> resend that out if I didn't send it to the attendees. But uh, Neben South Hall, she has a, she started a catalog. So on her website, like she's taking space out of her website just to do this. This is how like in thinking about selflessness, she has a list of indigenous designers that she's met. She has their nation. She has a link to their website. It would be nice if we just had one official uh, website that had all this cataloged for this. It'd be nice if, uh, you know, if our uh, social media spaces were a little bit larger. It would be nice if maybe university has this all archived. We don't have uh, all that just yet in a sense of, I feel like we're still just trying to make place in design communities. Uh, but in thinking about books, I know um, as a gentleman, the last name Gibson, he just came out with Indigenous Presents. Uh, but for those who are just you know, want, you know, just needing a list with some links, I would check out Neben's link to her graphic design list. Um, and what is so beautiful too, is that from that list or just kind of getting familiar with some of those names and hopefully in the next couple of years here, we'll have a little bit more consistency in annual conferences. We had a type conference last, uh, last, uh, uh, November, I'll drop the link in there too, but that type conference, um, had a solid lineup and it has some of the best indigenous designers um, who are actually doing the work and, and communicating. And I wish that um, that we could be doing that same conference this year. So I feel like there's just a lot of momentum and a lot of movement coming out of the pandemic space. But for the future, I do want to see you know a catalog. I want to have an opportunity to have annual conferences. I want to get more scholarships to indigenous students. We just don't have a, a solid uh, infrastructure to do all that just yet, but definitely goals for the future. And that's what makes it so fun or so exciting. <laughs> Got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then there's one more question that I, I would like to, to highlight. Um, 
Are there any locations uh, emerging to restore, house, and archive posters from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, or even digitally archiving them? I asked because I once visited a woman in, in Tucson who had a collection of hundreds of Native posters from music fest, powwows, and AIM meetings from California, Arizona, and New Mexico. Um, and uh, I just want to start with like a shameless plug here for Poster House. We are a collecting institution um, and uh, we would love to steward uh, those uh, posters. Uh, so if that's something that you're interested in, I would be happy to follow up. Uh, Brian Johnson also highlighted Letterform Archive um, based in uh, San Francisco that also does an excellent job of uh, stewarding a lot of these uh, graphic design ephemera. Um, Sadie, are there any other that you'd like to to, to highlight? Yeah, so I um, I don't necessarily, uh, other than let's say museums or university institutes that house uh, event promotional mater material from the few, from the last like five decades, or um, uh, I guess in thinking about places on sovereign nations that might house some material. So what I was trying to say in the presentation was um, majority of posters catalog that aren't necessarily music based, they're always in something a little bit more social justice or some, some type of fight. So in thinking about, uh, I know places like IHS have a lot of media, so Indian Health Services, uh, where you might find banks of posters, but again, the what's what's communicating in the posters isn't necessarily the the most positive or the the lively, or that's highlighting the beauties of let's say indigenous culture. But in thinking about just the poster artist or the poster designer, uh, is is probably one of the things I would love to see. Uh, kind of categorized out because we will get a lot or when we look through those archives and we see a lot of posters created by designers we don't have that necessarily the same freedom as maybe the non-indigenous uh, poster makers where uh, you know for example um, you know we didn't have things like Broadway <laughs> or like movies hmm. where we're necessarily making movie posters because we're just now getting the representation in like film or media or stuff like that so other than the archives listed right now, I don't necessarily have one, but I will say in thinking about looking at, uh, instead of using the word poster, you might find some more of that material maybe uh, within, um, how would you say, maybe more of the art practice uh, other than the design practice or the painters. Uh, usually you'll see a trend that you'll see in posters is a lot of paint work uh, commissioned onto a poster piece, just a target, just something that we see. But sometimes what's communicating doesn't necessarily make sense. But other than, let's say, maybe more health, uh, health institutions or museums, I know uh, many nations have museums within their, uh, their reservation areas or uh, um, universities. So I in, in my presentation, um, there, there's a uh, post, uh, posters archive, um, universities, particularly in student centers or native American centers, uh, depending on, uh, how would you say, how, whatever programming was going on at the university at that time. But I know universities or even tribal colleges in vicinity to those universities will probably be great resources. They'll have authentic or accurate descriptions in those archives. Another thing that to be mindful of is if you're looking at archival posters from like uh, the late 1800s to the really early 1900s to be mindful on how something might be mis, mis uh, documented um, and that could be with an intention. So again, we're still trying to go through archives just to make sure that uh, how items, inventions or posters are cataloged that they're described authentically because before they weren't commissioning an indigenous person to write those descriptions. So just kind of be wary on either stuff like that pre 1930s might be misarchived. Um, but in thinking about areas where you might find uh, large archives, IHSs, colleges, um, 
or, or museums, they might have um, some more on those. But then again, we weren't called graphic designers before like the 80s. So we might see us more like in the, in the uh, I don't know, not, not as say ancient North American art, but you might see a little bit more poster making the same, maybe from an indigenous painter than you might see an indigenous graphic designer. Yeah, thank you. Okay, last question. I know we're a little over on time and thank you so much for your generosity and, and sticking around to answer these. Um, we have a graphic design student at the University of North Texas and they chose to rebrand their tribe's government identity for a student project. Are there <laughs> any indigenous design societies or communities that you would recommend? It's been difficult to get feedback in class since everyone is mostly unfamiliar with native visual culture. Yeah, I would look at Western Oklahoma. Um, I know uh, Texas is a is a unique. It is not like it's it's not unique in a sense. There's a complex history in a sense of just the the relocation and the moving and then even the fight for sovereignty. As big as the state Texas is, they don't have that much sovereign recognition in that area. Um, you might see a little bit more access to maybe more the eastern area of of Oklahoma, or um, yeah, I'm I'm an, I'm gonna say more of states to the west of Texas, states to the east of Texas. Uh, colonization was hidden like 200 years before it started to move west. So there might be less uh, access to resources. Uh, and thinking about northern Texas, yeah, I'm thinking a little bit more Arkansas, Oklahoma area. But it's the thing about the terrain. If they're, depending on where at in north, uh, north of Texas, uh, in doing the the climate, the landscape is it still, is a is it a little bit high desert? Is it southern plains? If you can kind of grasp the tropes of the terrain, that's always a good start. Knowing what uh, flowers or plants or animals are indigenous to that area, uh, following maybe some of the um, the animal ecosystem migration patterns having those present somewhere just at the learning blocks, like the very basics, before you kind of get into bringing in like the, the languages, always highlight uh, in, in thinking about uh, the landscapes, because that will always be our advantage. We'll always be able to reland before any other race in the United States. So florals, beautiful. And then as you kind of progress, I always like to go to photo archives from like the 1800s. Again, Northern Texas may not have as solid as a archive as let's say maybe up by uh, South Dakota, but I would look at to the relatives more to the West of the state. So think about Oklahoma, Arkansas, maybe, nah, maybe not in so much Missouri in that sense. Um, and then again, and then just kind of keeping up to date on um, other maybe state recognized uh, nations that are in the area, urban areas. I know I see a lot of MMIW work coming out of maybe the Austin and Dallas area. I know conversations around the Mexican border are a lot different than conversations around the Canadian border. So, um, but just the starting point of the very basics, just those land, those land resources, because that will be our advantage. Wonderful. Sadie, thank you so much. This was such a fantastic presentation. I'm so excited to be able to reshare it with everyone uh, with the recording. And I just can't thank you enough for taking the time to share your scholarship with us and for answering all of these questions. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for everyone joining in. Um, I was so happy to see a lot of familiar names on the list. So I um, just appreciate you spending your lunch hour with me. And again, I, I'm always open for folks who folks who want to reach out. Um, and only so much we can do in a Zoom space, but contact information for sure. I check my emails more than I check my social media. So Sadie Redwing at Gmail. I'll just throw it in for everybody. Feel free to reach out. Um, we have a lot of stuff moving. Uh, in Canada that I hope the United States uh, starts to get picked up on, mostly speaking to design design schools in a sense. But again, always a pleasure. Thank you, Sal, for, for the invite. And um, I just appreciate the work that Poster House is doing. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>